Good afternoon, and uh, I hope you enjoyed your lunch and your lunchtime discussions. So now we have a panel on the future of renewables, the promised land of renewable energy. How do we get there? Um, it's moderated by David Mackay, and I'll let David introduce your panelists, if you'd like. Uh, we're going to, the timing's gone a bit awry. We're going to run this panel until 3.45, and then we'll change over to the second panel in this stream. So, David. Audience. Welcome, everyone. I'm David Mackay. I'm a professor at the University of Cambridge, and I'm chief scientific advisor to the Department of Energy and Climate Change in London. And on our panel today, we have uh, several of the Nobel laureates you already met earlier today, and we've been uh, joined by Elizabeth Reclu, who leads the fusion research at KTH Sweden and also the synchrotron research for investigation of small molecules. And uh, from earlier, we are uh, joined again by Steve Chu, David Gross, Alan Heger, and Hartmut Mich Michel. Is it Michel? Uh, Michel. Michel, I beg your pardon. So our, our brief is to look at the promised land of renewables. And I, I don't know if the organisers chose the term promised land to, to give the, the notion of renewable energy a, a bit of a religious flavour, but maybe earlier uh, today we did see a little bit of polarisation of, of views with some people saying, oh yes, we, we can do it, we can have renewables and energy efficiency and it can all be super cheap. And the, maybe economists saying, no, let's be realistic, here's what's really going to happen. And the penetration <coughs> of renewables by 20 2035, uh, we heard this morning will be 6 to 7 percent or, or so. So uh, it'd be interesting to hear from the uh, panelists uh, uh, whether you uh, disagreed with that projection for 2035 and what scientific and technical breakthroughs in renewables you think are possible and credible in the next 20 years. Who would like to? I can sure. start. Yes. So, uh, uh, since uh, I'm leading a study of Europe to look for this for 2050, but I think in this uh, context we are looking globally. And then, uh, say, the, for example, like we heard today, electricity is not available for a huge amount of people. And there I think that there are lots of possibilities that uh, uh, photovoltaic to take care of the sun to produce electricity, that that would be a really good thing for a large part. Of it. And there we see many, many good uh, uh, developments, both with the materials for the solar cells and their efficiency. So the, the thing that is most difficult is to make it this word you have cost effective. So. Yes. Maybe uh, since the next session this afternoon is going to be uh, addressing the, uh, the needs of the developing uh, world, uh, perhaps it'd be interesting for this session to focus on the potential for re renewable breakthroughs to deal with the developed world what, uh, and what breakthroughs mm -hmm. there, there could be or need to, to be. Um, and when, when I say breakthroughs uh, on the science and technology side, I'd include not just the renewables <laughs> systems themselves, but the support systems that uh, the renewables might need. So, Steve, you mentioned earlier the, the role of, of storage. So, uh, do, do you anticipate there being a, a breakthrough, say, in, in the cost of, of storage uh, so that batteries, say, are going to become significantly lighter and cheaper? Well, let me begin by redefining what a breakthrough means so that we at least are on the same page and the same page as the audience. Uh, if you consider a breakthrough in, for example, integrated circuits, a doubling of the number of transistors every two years, uh, is that a breakthrough? Well, yes, I think. But if it continues for several decades, it's a breakthrough, uh, even though it's a steady progress along certain fronts. So we've seen a similar sort of thing in renewables in the sense that solar, it's not as quite fast, it's not uh, a decrease in price every two years, but it is, there's a, um, an experience or learning curve that's marching the price of solar, the price of wind down steadily over the coming decades. And then you say, when will it stop? Well, there you need to have a little window into the future in the sense that where are people what is happening in the lab? What are, what are people trying today? And, and for those to renewables, uh, I don't see it bottoming out for at least a decade. So it, it, I think it still will be marching down the learning curve. And in the United States, renewables and wind, for example, as I said, 
in a class three or four wind site, uh, it's the second cheapest. The cheapest is natural gas, this is the second. It's cheaper than new coal. Um, it's about seven to seven uh, and a half cents of generation, levelized cost of electricity. Um, and, uh, and if you're in Europe, seven and a half cents levelized cost of electricity generation, it's cheaper than most of your electricity. Right. That's not yes. retail, that's, that's, that's generation, that's wholesale. Um, I see a similar thing with batteries. For a long time after the invention of lithium ion, there was a, there was a stagnation. But in the last 10 years, um, all of a sudden, both lithium, first lithium graphite, now going to lithium, lithium silicon, uh, the uh, cathode materials changing, uh, manganese mixtures, iron phosphate mixtures, all of these things, I see steady progress. Uh, I mentioned that the cost of manufacturing has dropped in half. Every battery manufacturer that I know thinks the cost will drop a half again, whether it's five or eight years, somewhere around that time scale. Whether it drops to one quarter, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, do you consider that a breakthrough? Well, if it's slow state progress over a decade and drops, let's say, one third, let's split the difference, that's pretty good. Yes, so uh, I'd personally say a, a fourfold reduction sounds fantastic, though. It, it, uh, yes, <laughs> and, but for storage to really achieve a breakthrough, to unlock the potential of renewables, it's, it's got to be cheap enough that you can okay. actually store the okay. electricity. So, so there's more depth there. I, I think it, if you look at storage at about $150 a kilowatt hour that can store in megawatt quantities, uh, that begins to begin to uh, be the utility scale stores, certainly where you can do day-night shifting. Mm -hmm. Now, do you still need something that will tide you over for several weeks if there's a several week dearth of wind or several cloud a week. Well, there we're going to have to use, let's say, natural gas and, and peaking plants. But beyond things like that, this day-night shifting, uh, $160 a kilowatt hour, even 200 but certainly $160 will do it. So let's talk more about uh, yeah, yes, Professor well, Higa. <clears throat> I personally do a lot of work, my work on, is focused on photovoltaics, but I'm very enthusiastic about uh, wind, and more generally about moving turbines, whether it's wind or water. Uh, you know there, there is a uh, turbine system in the Hudson River that is generating electricity for New York. There are plans, I think maybe even partially implemented, uh, for putting very large-scale systems into the Gulf Stream. Uh, it doesn't go off at night. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think, uh, I, I think there are possibilities of, of major sources of energy uh, from moving turbines in fluids, wind or water. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's going to be important. So, yes, some countries do have access to, to water that could give much more predictable uh, power, but there are technical limits to, to the potential of those, perhaps, yeah. except maybe the Gulf Stream. <laughs> um, so, perhaps we should think a bit more about the intermittency side of things. So, if we were to imagine a promised land in which we're using uh, wind at very large scale and solar at very large scale. It, it, in Germany, the, in, the average intensity of sunshine in July is 10 times greater than the average intensity in, in January. So uh, there's an enormous variation between seasons. So if we wanted solar to be playing a really large role, we'd need to have a way of storing energy from one season uh, to another, not just uh, overnight. Uh, That's a hard problem. Uh, are there thoughts on, on that challenge and whether but if you think about the wind power, then there is a lot of development in the offshore wind now so that one uses the technology from the oil companies and have mobile platforms and you can have the stations where it's also deep water. So, for example, they are building a huge wind park outside of Fukushima which is for one gigawatt, and then you only need to take the cable, which is no problem then into Fukushima, and you have the whole distribution. And for Sweden, we could have it directly, if people are angry at nuclear power, you could have it outside Ringhals here on the 
or you can have it on the east coast is very good and you don't need to put all the wind inside the, the country and you also have more wind and more stable and you can also move them so then it's even better. What, uh, may, may I object in Germany of course there was lots of investment of uh, having the offshore wind parks in the North Sea. For the moment the tendency is going back to have more on land because it looks like that there are many unsolved technological problems and, uh, and it looks like that it's cheaper to, to have, the, have the windmills on the land, despite the fact that, that, uh, that uh, you can produce more wind energy and electric energy from the offshore plants. But that, I think, is depending on the time scale you have. Of course, it's cheaper today, but they have already built big ships that bring out the plants, how to build up the offshore, and all this technology comes from the oil platforms, which is quite a nice new development. And, of course, it's much cheaper to do wind today, but uh, we said sort of 20 years from now. I just well, let's hope for the best. It's a biofuel. Mm. So, uh, David, uh, uh, another renewable which is growing in, in, in Europe at the moment is bioenergy, that many countries are aiming to satisfy their renewable targets for 2020 by significant uh, use of bioenergy. Uh, do you want to I am uh, certainly comments not, on that? Not, uh, not an expert, but I, I was struck by the fact that today biofuels have barely been mentioned. I was recently at a, at a similar meeting in Brazil and half the talk was about biofuels, not surprisingly. And uh, I really would like to ask the experts what, what is the prospects for biofuels in a way that does not disrupt the, uh, you know, the production of food, which we also need, and, and destroy the water tables, et cetera, et cetera. Is there a way of taking advantage of plants? Oh, uh, that is very difficult uh, to, to use bio, biomass. Of course, you can produce biomass. But the major point is that uh, you have to convert that into biofuels. And this is very... Uh, you, use, you need a lot of energy first to, to produce the biomass. And second, you need energy for the conversion from the biomass to the, to the biofuels. And uh, photosynthesis as such is a very inefficient pro uh, process because there are many, many individual steps involved and uh, not all of them are perfect. They are optimized for speed but not for efficiency, they are steps in for individual steps in photosynthesis. And as a result of that, uh, you barely save 1% of the sun's energy in the biomass. And you lose a lot of energy then by converting the biomass into, uh, into the biofuel. And as a result of that, uh, the efficiency for biodiesel is less than 0.1%. And you can do very simple calculations back on the envelope that when you use the entire area of Germany to produce biodiesel, you simply, you would, uh, you would supply maybe 10% of the cons current consumption of, of German cars and trucks. So we cannot, we cannot do that. We have alternative. Uh, what, is, was, what is considered to, uh, to, uh, to be to, now to be very important was that uh, we produce maize, corn, as the Americans say, uh, to produce to use corn for fermentation in biogas plants. And currently, about 20% of uh, the German agricultural land is used for maize production for biogas. If you if you analyze that process, you would need uh, you would have to double the entire area of Germany. And, uh, and use it completely for the, for the growth of corn or maize, and you still would not be able to, uh, to provide the current electricity from, from, bio, from, from, the, from the Gaia gas production. So that is, uh, uh, we have already dramatic consequences because farmers earn more by growing maize for biogas production than by growing wheat. Germany was an exporter of wheat three years ago. Now we are an importer. And this is simply due to the change of uh, usage of the land for the biogas production. Mm. And this clearly has, has, an, has an effect on the price for the, for the wheat and for the food. Mm. David. But I, I think um, the reason I brought up Brazil was that uh, perhaps the discussion here is a little too Eurocentric. For Brazil, Germany fits into Brazil maybe a hundred times. Mm. And I was told there are areas of Brazil which are really unusable for agriculture, but great for sugarcane, and they can improve the, uh, the use of the waste products that they now produce, and there's an incredible uh, research and development area in, as they already do, as you know, utilizing their natural resources, 
and perhaps in Africa, other places in the world. Not Germany, it makes no sense perhaps, but you know, there's the rest of the world. Is it a solution for Brazil? That is. Of course, I ended up in a discussion with some Brazilian scientists being critical about bioethanol production, at least in Germany, because I did the calculation that you need by a factor of 400 to 600 less land for, for driving a car via the electric way or via the biofuel way. And they ended up and, uh, with, with alternative discussions, but they still came up that uh, you need still need 100 times more land if you go there, even the Brazilian way. Brazilian, uh, if you do the calculations for Brazil, then it's about 0.2% of the sunlight in Brazil, which is, ends up in the bioethanol. And uh, they don't need so much external energy to produce the bioethanol because they use the squeezed stems, the bargas, for burning. They, they use that for producing electricity and they use the heat for distillation of, uh, for distillation of ethanol. So this is economically, more, uh, more suited than, than it is, but still, compared to, compared to the land use, it's very bad. But also in Brazil, what you observe is that you get now production of uh, soybean in the tropical rainforest area. And uh, the production of soybean and the yield is the lowest in biodiesel at all. Biodiesel produced from, 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 from soybean, the yield is so low, it's even much lower than the, than the, than the production of biodiesel from German rapeseed. Perhaps I could throw in one, one issue, David, if we are going for a vision of using Brazil to help out the, the rest of the world. Uh, Two-thirds of the climate change has come from fossil fuels. The, where did the other third come from? It came from mainly land use change. Uh, so people have taken land that was forested and turned it into agricultural land, and that has released carbon from the land because you get less carbon per unit area. So uh, something to look at very carefully if, if we are to advocate using Brazil is the potential carbon consequences that you might be actually creating a very large carbon emission from that change of, of land use. Um, I don't know if the technicians can show the map of the world that I uh, supplied in the PDF file. Thank you. Uh, this is just to show visually uh, what uh, Hartmut was, uh, was uh, partly referring to. This is a map of the world showing each country's area by the size of, of the, the dot. The population density of the country is on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is the energy consumption per person today. And they're both logarithmic scales. And uh, so... Uh, that means that uh, the, these straight lines of slope minus one are lines of equal power uh, consumption per unit area. Um, for example, Norway and Sweden and Saudi Arabia and Mexico and India back in 1990 are all consuming 0.1 watts per square meter. So that's a fairly typical figure. But 80% of the world's population uh, lives in countries that have higher power per unit area than 0.1 watts per square meter. The UK and Germany and Japan, for example, are up at 1.25 watts per square meter. And now if you can click forward to page six, just give it five clicks um, on, on the uh, clicker. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. I've shrunk the, the map down now and added some contours for the power per unit area of, of renewables. So when, when we say, oh, let's do lots of wind uh, or let's do lots of bioenergy, this tells you what the power per unit area today of these technologies is. So energy crops deliver half a watt per square meter in Europe. In Brazil, maybe you can get about one watt per, per square meter. Wind power in windy European countries delivers 2.5 watts per square meter. Uh, this is comparing primary energy consumption in these countries uh, with uh, uh, so all energy, not just electricity, with what you could get from these renewables. So, uh, yes, wind power has huge potential, but you do, do need wind farms half the size of Germany to completely produce today's primary energy consumption of, of, of Germany. And you can put them offshore if you want, but then it'll be um, half the size of Germany off offshore. Solar uh, facilities in cloudy countries like uh, the UK, Sweden and Germany deliver about 5 watts per square meter of solar park. In sunny locations you get about 10 watts uh, per, per square meter. So there's not much of a gap between the actual consumption today of uh, countries like Germany and the UK in power per unit area and what many of these re renewables deliver. So an, another important issue is, is the, the actual um, size of the renewable facilities that would be required if we did want to uh, have a vision of a mainly renewable future. Steve. Okay. This is a little confusing to me because um, 
because I, I would have plotted slightly differently because you need, if you're talking about renewables in terms of uh, either biomass or solar photovoltaic or s solar thermal, I, I mean, not solar wind, uh, that it would really depend on how close to the equator you are. Mm. And so, for example, southern United States, you know, Texas, Arizona, Southern California, very good places. Uh, Northern Africa, very good places for solar. Uh, uh, yes, we both uh, love data, and I can show you yeah, more data and, as you, and, you get and, up to. Right. And in, so, so in Hawaii, like, you can get to yeah. 20 watts per so, square meter. You know, so I, I saw <laughs> a, Canada and Russia up there, and I was thinking, you know, these are not good places for, you know, quite candidly, Germany's not a good place for solar. Hmm. Let me also say that, you know, you can't separate land use from, there's land use for food, there's land use for energy. For most of the Europe, land use for energy does not make sense. Uh, and so I think there's no disagreement here. Uh, in, in Brazil, let's not conflate soybean for animal feed, which is what they're chopping down the Brazilian rainforest for. Uh, it's not really for uh, diesel fuel. It's mostly for animal feed. Mm -hmm. And so you, one should also mention that, uh, that mm -hmm. as developing countries get richer, their demand for meat goes up, and then all of a sudden you have animal feed, corn, soybean being raised for animal feed. Uh, uh, 10 times or uh, the inefficiency, if you will, than having people eat it directly if, if they want high meat diets. So this is all part of this whole thing. Most countries, biofuels doesn't make sense. I think in Brazil and parts of the United States, it might make partial sense. But uh, in parts of Africa, again, not to chop down rainforests, but there are parts of Africa that do make sense. Uh, but most of the other places around the world, Europe especially, there are also parts of Asia that don't make sense for biofuels, uh, but so it's not as simple as a yes or no. Yes, uh, that's agreed. <laughs> um, so attention often focuses on electricity, but there are these difficult to electrify sectors, the, the transport side of, of, of things, especially freight and international shipping and aviation, and there's the whole of industry. Uh, what do you think is the best way to, uh, you know, if renewables are going to penetrate those difficult sectors, the transport and the heating and the, the industry, how do you think that would be delivered? <coughs> well, you... David. Biofuels <laughs> <laughs> would seem to me to be, you know, perhaps um, developed particularly to, to have a replacement for fossil fuel airplanes. They, they exist, yes? Yes, uh, you can. For what for? Yeah. Well, well if, if, first let's start with airplanes and, and long distance travel. Airplanes, uh, trains where there's no electrification, uh, and boats. Uh, then we're mostly talking about liquid fuel, high density, especially airplanes. Uh, and in that case, uh, it, it could be biofuels, it could be for, it's going to be a liquid hydrocarbon. If you have inexpensive electricity, really inexpensive electricity, you can maybe use the electricity to form a liquid hydrocarbon. The verdict's not in. Right now, the, what we do know is that uh, biofuel jet fuel replacement is not competitive with petroleum. Uh, uh, in fact, nothing is competitive <laughs> with petroleum currently. Uh, but, but this is a science issue as to whether we can actually invent something. Elizabeth? Yeah, I wanted to say uh, we had in, uh, a study here in Sweden and then we, about the biofuels, and then we really came up with that we should go to methanol. That that would really be the way to go. And as I understand, they have several, many cars in China already run on methanol. In Sweden, it's not allowed to have methanol in the cars. I don't know why, but... Uh, that would really be, and we could uh, produce methanol also, right? So that uh, would possibly for cars, but if, uh, if you, but not for airplanes. No, but for the ships. Energy, for uh, ships, there, there, there are a big ships company <laughs> yeah, going ships, now. Ships, ships, yes. possibly, yes, but not no, for airplanes. Not airplanes. for airplanes, no. Many people uh, who have a vision of uh, a promised land of renewables actually have different visions from each other. For some people, it's about localism and community ownership and decentralization. And for others, it's about uh, going and invading Brazil. Sorry, not Bra invading Brazil, but uh, asking Brazil politely if, if, if David can go ahead and do lots of bioenergy in Brazil. And 
international supergrids and tankers taking bioethanol from one place to another. What, what's your vision? Uh, maybe I could go through uh, all of you and, and ask in that spectrum what, what you think the promised land would be like. David? <laughs> no, I'm a little confused as to what you're getting at. The, uh, at some point, we will run out of petroleum. Uh, we all would like to come to conferences like this. We will require airplanes and some high-density fuel. The only one that exists now is petroleum or biofuels. We'll have a lot of useless tankers, by the way. So I'm not, and the distribution problem isn't necessarily the problem. We do that now with fossil fuels. Uh, and we probably should try to think of invent. I mean, this is a, actually a great place where a scientific breakthrough could make a difference. There's very little incentive to invent a replacement for airplane fuels now. Mm -hmm. It's available and will be perhaps for a century or two. Yes, I was asking a more general question than just aviation. And, so, uh, so and, it, and as far as your it, panoply of possibilities, obviously one should do all of the above. I mean, there are local solutions and there are global solutions, and, and it's not either or, but both. So, and again, it depends where. Yeah. In, a, in, a, in, uh, in a city, uh, putting it on the rooftop, putting it on the facade of a building, uh, local my house is uh, the right way to do it. Uh, in some countries. That's what I say. Uh, <laughs> but uh, other places, power plants with you know, gr uh, solar f farms, so to speak, is the way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, yeah. I also would say that uh, it's, most, uh, it's, it's the best to produce as much energy locally as you can. And uh, if you look for, uh, for now for the photovoltaic cells, it makes much sense that each roof is covered by photovoltaic cells and the local owner of the, or the inhabitants of the house use that electricity. You know, in Germany, we pay to our, electro, to, our, to our power supplier 30 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, this is actually, if we produce it with the current technology from the photovoltaic cells, uh, cells ourselves, we are, we, it's cheaper, we save money. So that's a clear advantage. And the other thing is storage of uh, electric energy at the end, if we have much better and safer batteries, should be each house should have a room in somewhere in the basement where we can store the energy which is consumed uh, by the people of the house for, for, for several weeks. So decent, uh, decentralization is, is a major thing. But say, globally, a major breakthrough, I, I would think, would be to have high temperature superconductivity cables. This would mean that you could transport electricity without a loss around the globe. And if uh, you have your sorbus, light is shining on two-thirds of the globe. So you can have the, the energy from there and transport it without any loss to the places where you need it in, in the night. So super con high temperature superconductivity would it be, in my opinion. But this is, of course, we have to find out how to get that. And we have to understand high temperature superconductivity. That's a problem for physicists and material scientists and so on. But this, in my opinion, would be the ultimate, ultimate solution. So the international supergrid has uh, well, that, one advocate. Uh, that would be a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> High temperatures of conductivity would be a breakthrough that would help us on many different things. <laughs> and it's also uh, very difficult. <laughs> Shall we go to the audience uh, for some questions? Please put up your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and we'll, we'll get a, a microphone uh, to you. Uh, yes, uh, up there, halfway up, a second in. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I have a question regarding the fact that you uh, previously said that it's not thinkable or likely to uh, use biofuel uh, within airplanes or planes. Would it be possible to perhaps use the same technology as uh, in uh, some submarines with nuclear power? So let, let's first... There, you must have misheard it. We did not say that it's, biofuels cannot be used in airplanes. What was said was that currently biofuels for jet fuel is not economically competitive. Okay? You can actually make jet fuel uh, but from biofuels. There, there, there have been E. coli and yeast that have been reprogrammed. You feed them simple sugars, they will make replacement jet fuel. Uh, so that's, but it's the commerciality, the feasibility is the question. 
I think Richard Feynman had a story about the patent people coming to see him when he was working in America, and they wanted him to make more patents, and, and, and he, he said, oh, well, you, know, you want patent ideas? You know, they're easy to make, and one of his ideas was the nuclear-powered aeroplane, and, and his story ended up with, uh, he gave them a list of things that he invented, and apparently they did patent one of his nuclear-powered something or others. But, but it also <laughs> regards to your question about, you said in, uh, essentially I was hearing new Nuclear powered airplane? Yes. It was, it, was that the <laughs> suggestion or question? Yeah. Uh, well, it, you know, it, it, its crassworthiness uh, would, would be of con some concern. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it's too heavy. Uh, the shielding uh, is, 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 is a non starter because of the. wouldn't work either. Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of things uh, that uh, would not make it feasible. Let's uh, take a, a, a question from the internet, please. Yes. Um, thank you for the interesting discussion so far. We have one question from the online audience. Um, what do you think is most important to speed up the development of renewables and drive down the costs? And, and what do you think is the largest hurdle? I mean, uh, solar and wind are becoming competitive, but what about other renewable technologies? Let's make, let's make solar and wind first. Let's get, let's get it there. Uh, we know uh, that the capability is there. Uh, the, the efficiencies are going up, the costs are coming down. Uh, now we have to implement it. So what's the best way to drive down costs? Is it to give money to researchers and the inventors in sheds who are coming up with new prototypes? Or is it to have government-led subsidies pulling through? Uh, well, giving it to research is, as we've heard, uh, slowly returning. Uh, time scale is long. It, it, will, it will. It will work, but it takes time. Elizabeth. But you also have to have the effort uh, between the scientists and actually making the prototype. You know, with my colleagues who are working on the photovoltaics and they have got very good results, but then the money must be there to start the sort of bigger test plant also, and that well, is where one should, should put in some effort also you can, now. You can make pilot, pilot level, yeah. pilot line sc scale, which yeah. is uh, a good, good way to test, of yeah. course. Steve, I'd love to hear your answer. You must have had a big budget, uh, <laughs> and you must have thought about the, the trade-off between uh, investment at various stages of the innovation chain. Well, while, while this was going on, I was actually thinking about the nuclear, so let me just finish this. <laughs> there is one caveat on what I said, and that is, uh, nuclear as a thermal source has been used in satellites for many decades. Uh, so, so it's not the standard type of nuclear reaction you have in nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. but it's nuclear where it's uh, alpha emitters, it's easily shielded, and, but, but there's a, a power issue. It's not high power. Uh, but you can lock, take these things, you can put them on a satellite, and you can send them to the, you know, uh, uh, the, the things that were powering... Um, uh, the satellites that go fly by to Saturn, to Jupiter, Uranus, and Voyagers, these are nuclear powered, but of a very different type. And so, so that, just to complete the answer to that, I did, didn't want to give something that nuclear power is not, it's, it's still not practical for airplanes. And in, in the good old 60s, I think the Americans <laughs> did put a, a reactor on an airplane. It wasn't powering the airplane, yes. but they did show that they could uh, have a reactor in flight and they, they managed to shield the occupants. Yes. But Steve, I'd really like to, to hear your, your answer to the, the question we, we just had, which is what's the best way to drive down the costs of renewables? So you've seen the world from the, the lab end and you've been uh, in the Department of, of Energy. Yes. What's the right <clears throat> way for a government to, uh, dis, to drive down the I, costs? I, I personally think the best resources for the government is mostly in the research and development. Uh, the more it gets towards demonstration, piloting, and deployment, the less the government should be involved in it. Uh, first, it's too costly. Secondly, it's, um, uh, it should be ripe for the private sector to be picking it up. I'm not a big advocate for spending many billions of dollars to nudge something forward because I've seen too many times where you invest a billion dollars or half a billion dollars or two billion dollars uh, in a, developing a technology and then the only reason the private sector is partnering with you is for that subsidy 
their business plans, when the subsidy goes away, they go away. And so I'd rather, and that's why I talked a lot about driving the costs of solar down, driving the cost of wind down, driving transmission distribution. Uh, long before we we're gonna get superconducting, what we in the Department of Energy decided that if we can prove the electronics that allow you to step up uh, voltages to make it high voltage DC and step it down very efficiently, that's pretty good. China has a 800 plus miles, 800 kilovolt DC line. It's about 1,000 miles. They lose something like 5 or 6% of the energy hmm. power. That's pretty good. Uh, and they're building a 1 megawatt volt line. Okay, that electronics, that's within our grasp. That's the kind of technology we would need to put solar panels in the Algerian desert, okay, in Libyan desert. You don't need, you know, 1,500 miles is good enough for a lot of things. So Steve is favoring innovation support and cr implicitly criticizing yes. the, uh, the more European approach where we also have extremely large tens of billions per year being put into subsidies through feed-in tariffs and, and well, so on. As long, but, they must uh, have a, a, a gradual sunset. Uh, you know, German tariff actually did have a sunset. It, it was a little rich for my taste at the beginning, but, <laughs> but you still need a, a, a sunset close. I think wind by the end of this decade, in the United States at least, uh, even the Wind Association says we don't need a subsidy. And, and do you think it was a mistake on the long, along the way to, to give so many tens of billions uh, to, to these technologies through feed intensive? No, 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 no. Uh, I think in the beginning, you know, renewable portfolios and something like that was important. But right now, wind and solar are at a very different place. And so, uh, you know, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, perhaps so. But, but we're, we're getting in a comfortable place. Would anyone like to add in before we go for the next question? There's one other topic we haven't discussed much. Maybe it's because it will be discussed later, which is nuclear power. Mm -hmm. Which uh, I, I think is something that scientists, especially physicists, can speak to. Uh, because it's taken sort of for granted in many places throughout the world, especially in Europe. And uh, that this is not a part of the solution, and I, I simply cannot understand that, mm -hmm. except for irrational reasons. And, and it's, us scientists should combat that irrationality, I think. Uh, Yes, when we were given the title of this session, it was about renewables, but I did wonder whether we were al allowed to uh, talk about the promised land of low carbon oh, energy and, uh, and, and generalize it. Nuclear what? power and eventually fusion power, which uh, we assume will work on the time scale that we're, we're concerned about, uh, are pretty renewable by human scale. And... Um, Yes. And, and like with the issue of climate control, the debate and government policy uh, is, more, is more governed by irrationality than by rationality. Who'd like to respond? Elizabeth, you work, uh, work in fusion. Yeah, since I work uh, uh, with fusion, but now I work a lot with fission also to look at it and saying that uh, Nuclear energy is not something where everything is put in a box and fixed and either you have it or you don't have it. It's a, it's a field where you develop a lot. And if you think about the fission there, we can have, we have uh, gener generation two and three and now we have water cool. We can go over to have a liquid metal cool. There have always been, already been reactors working like that with that being closed down. We can have a closed fuel cycle we can uh, use thorium as the fuel also. So uh, we, can, we have now quite a lot of uh, fuel that we could use again in, in reactors so that we don't need even to take up more uranium. We can have a combination of fusion and fission. Our old uh, uh, jet uh, constructor, uh, Professor Rebu, he thinks so now that that would be faster to go through than a fusion reactor. And with the fusion, we really have a fast track already for saying where we go. Right now we are building ITER, which is the worldwide experiment with seven parties that will start in something 2018-19 and maybe by 2030 we will be ready to say what kind of uh, uh, fusion reactor should we have as a demo. 
So it is a little bit longer time scale than you had here, but it's definitely one of the base powers which is fossil free. So I think also, like uh, David Gross said, that you said it very well, that it's really irrationality, but then we need to meet that. So we need to meet it through education. Hartford, you live in Frankfurt, so uh, you're in a country that David was referring to a moment ago. What, what's your feeling on this? About nuclear power? On nuclear power, yes. Nuclear power, I think it was a wrong decision to switch off the... Uh, uh, to switch off all the nuclear power, to make the decision to switch off the, the nuclear power, uh, nuclear reactor so, so early. Uh, this was simply because uh, the German Chancellor wanted to be re-elected. Uh, that was the only reason, in my opinion. <laughs> Let's go to the audience for another question. Uh, there's someone in the middle there, two in. Five rows back, second in. Where's my second microphone? Hi, my name is Chuck Cornell. I'm from the University of Nevada. I want to thank you very much for the very interesting conversation. Um, I've been intrigued by the conversation of renewables and especially the lack of discussion about uh, geothermal. Mm -hmm. In my hometown in Reno, Nevada, we have about 40% of our power is produced by geothermal. And I understand there's important geological reasons for that. But uh, enhanced geothermal is something that perhaps should have some future. And I'd be curious to hear your comments about that. Good. So the question's about enhanced geothermal, where you drill down up to 10 kilometers uh, deep, crack the rocks, pump down water, and get um, very high temperature steam coming up the other side. Who'd like to? Iceland. Yeah. Yes, so Iceland is a, a prime example. Uh, Steve? Well, I think he's talking about, you know, Iceland has natural geothermal, meaning that it has the water supply. Uh, Nevada has... Uh, the geysers in other places, they have natural geothermal in that there's a basin, there's a natural supply of water. So what he's talking about is enhanced geothermal where you um, actually supply the water, uh, you then extract the heat from the water, and then you try to recycle the water back as much as possible. It can also be generalized not only to water, but to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has less heat capacity but it has lower viscosity. It has maybe a point, the density might be 0.6 relative to water in, at those temperatures and pressures. So one of the issues is um, an induced seismicity in geothermal. Uh, one has to do these experiments for some reasons, unbeknownst to Californians. Uh, uh, magnitude threes get people nervous, um, <laughs> but uh, it, it does. It, it, a magnitude four and a half uh, would stop everything in its tracks, and so induced seismicity is a problem. The other thing about enhanced geothermal that one has to realize is, uh, except for those rare natural cases which seem to go steady state, if you look at, the, for example, the MIT report on enhanced geothermal, it's a heat extraction for a couple of decades. And then you've kind of done in that reservoir, and you have to go somewhere else. It's not a forever heat extraction. The conductivity of the rock is too slow. And so, so then you have to go somewhere else. You can maybe return decades later. Centuries but, later. <laughs> uh, but that becomes more expensive because of the piping. Uh, also, uh, drilling technology uh, has to be improved. When you're drilling for oil at 80 or $100 a barrel, that's okay. When you're drilling for heat uh, and you're going down as deep, uh, that gets a little dicey. So, but, but the good news is that drilling uh, technologies can also improve, especially if you can start to drill with a seamless pipe, drawn pipe, rather than uh, steel pipe that you have to screw together. Uh, now, that's a drilling technology that means you need a, a totally different type of bit. The way we drill today is we have weight on bit. So this is the Howard Hughes diamond patent drilling bit that hasn't really changed that much. Um, there's a new technology where you have laser ablation assisted grinding. The weight on bit becomes drastically less. The amount of power going down uh, several kilometers is still possible in multi-mode. If that's the case, then you can be having tubes on long cable uh, tubes. Uh, then you're in a new ball game. Then geothermal be may become possible. But this is research. I happen to know this because we sponsor this research, we, the Department of Energy. But, but it, that, that could be a game changer if you can get 
drilling without weight on bit. If you can get drilling that has seamless tubing instead of uh, screwing pipes together, then you're in a totally different ballgame. Uh, but that would also be good for geothermal locally for homes in the Midwest and the United States. You go 30, 40 feet down, it's, it's, it's about 20 degrees centigrade. That's, you know, Goldilocks just right. So in the summer, it's too hot. In the winter, it's too cold. But you just have a very modest heat exchanger, uh, and it works great. Alan, did, yeah, Elizabeth, did, and Alan. I can just add that in Sweden, they're building quite a lot of uh, going drilling about 100 meters down, and especially for single houses. But now they have allowed even in Stockholm to drill in the pavements where we are walking. So now they drill a lot. And there was even a couple of years ago, the drill came down just in front of the subway because <laughs> things go so quickly now that they haven't coordinated all the approvals uh, departments in the city. <laughs> Your energy is higher than our energy. So, <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things you do in Sweden, we can't do in the United States. Oh. You're, you're two or three times higher. <laughs> oh, okay. I wanted to finish with uh, a question of, of mine, which I uh, sent to you uh, uh, before. It's a question about memorable scientific facts or numbers that you think everyone ought to know. I was wondering, do you have a, a favorite important fact or number that people should know to have insightful, constructive discussions about energy options. Uh, David. Well, uh, my only suggestion is look it up in your book. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's very kind. <laughs> Elizabeth. Yeah, I have the same answer. What is it? <laughs> about 100 watts per square meter? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, what they're talking about is a sort of incident energy on Earth. There, there's another one in addition to that. Uh, the incident energy is better to the equatorial plane, which, which really cries for transmission and distribution. The other thing is energy density per unit weight and energy density per unit volume, yeah. Yeah. as well as energy density of sunlight hitting the Earth. Yeah. Alan? So many kilowatts per square meter and one kilowatt per square meter at noon in Santa Barbara? Yes. For the number? Really? <laughs> I would say it's uh, that if you produce biofuels, you store less than 0.1% of the sun's energy. Using plants. Using plants. Using plants. Using plants. <laughs> 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 and algae. <laughs> well, I'd like us all to, to thank our wonderful panel for a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much. while we change over so just be please um, if you can just stay seated and we'll be with you in just a very few minutes
fine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, good afternoon again, everybody, and thank you for waiting. Um, so now we go on with the second panel in this stream one. And this is a panel on energy access. I should check the title. What is it? How do we meet the challenge of providing energy access to all? And I'm honoured to be joined by four distinguished panellists. We have Elaine Weidmann Grunwald from Ericsson, who's Director of Sustainability and Corporate Responsibility. We have David Mackay, who you've just met in the previous panel. Richendi, you, you met during the morning session. And Fatih, you met during the morning sessions. Now, I'd like to start by... I think, I think it, it's clear that there is an enormous unserved population. That point has been made clear, and it's also been made clear that everybody wants to address the issue of energy access. I'd like to start by asking the question, what do we mean by energy access? Do we mean a very, very small amount of energy for lots of people, or are we more ambitious than that? David. I'd like to pick up from Roshenda's uh, presentation uh, and uh, show a, a figure from uh, a company called uh, Azuri, who are marketing self-financed solar facilities for people in India uh, and Africa. So if we could have my one slide. Uh, this shows, again, the, the tiny solar panel on the, on the roof of a, an African hut in Sudan. And the idea is this panel can charge up batteries in the yellow blob inside the house. And those batteries can subsequently give you light. And they can charge your phone. And those are both very, very valuable things that people would have to pay more for, uh, to get, use kerosene to provide light, for example. Uh, and phone charging can be very difficult for a place with no electricity grid uh, as well. And this shows the escalator that the company is trying to help people get up. The, the idea is they're using scratch cards, using a pay-as-you-go methodology where you, you uh, buy a scratch card and then put the number from the scratch card into the yellow box, and that's your way of paying off the cost of the system, which stops working if you don't uh, feed it the scratch card numbers. Okay, but David, let me just stop you there, just to ask the question, at what point on that escalator have we achieved energy access? Yeah, so that's where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so if we could ha have the slider again, sorry. Uh, it, three watts is the power from the panel that you need uh, at midday to give that service of light and phone uh, charging. And that's extremely valuable and has impact in terms of educational benefit and health benefits from not using kerosene and so forth. But that's only three watts. As you progress up the escalator, you get to the 10 watt panel, which will give you four lights, a phone and a radio. Then having paid that off over a year, you can progress to the 40 watt panel that will give you the, the lights, the phone, the radio and a TV. And then having paid that off over the next year, the, the aspiration would be that people get onto the 80 watt system, which is giving them all of those things and the ability to run a sewing machine. But that's still only 80 watts peak, which gives them uh, an average output of maybe uh, 20, uh, 10 or 20 watts, uh, depending on the, on the sunshine. And when you compare that with the energy consumption of the average European, the average European is using 5,000 watts of primary energy consumption. So this is fantastic. This is transformative. But we're not actually getting them anywhere near what a European takes for granted. We haven't got them their fridge freezer, their washing machine. We haven't sorted out their, their uh, cooker with this per particular model. And we certainly haven't given them transportation. In the developed world, about a third of our energy, a third of that 5,000 watts, is going into running transportation systems of various sorts. And to, to actually be able to run an electric car off solar panels would mean solar panels not this big on your, your roof, but uh, roughly 100 square meters of panels is what you would need to actually run a, an electric car. So I think what we're describing here is fantastic and transformative and wonderful, but we must be realistic that if we are really trying to give energy access in the sense of allowing everyone to have a European lifestyle, then we need to go way beyond the top of, of this escalator. We need thousands of watts to uh, enable the European lifestyle. Yeah. I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to be a little bit provocative because I don't think it's a question of we giving it to anybody. I would say energy markets exist. They exist everywhere around the world. The problem is that for very low income households and communities, they're not very efficient, they're not very effective, and the quality of what they're delivering is not very good. It doesn't really solve the problem very well for the family. So as I mentioned this morning, uh, a low income household may be paying up to 30% 
of their income for their energy services. And the question is how we can, using the energy escalator example, how we can utilize um, those cash outlays to provide a much better solution. But I would say maybe it's, uh, I, I don't want to stretch the analogy too far, but it's really an ecosystem of services. It's not only about what we're helping those households to be able to provide for their needs, as I mentioned earlier, about cooking solutions and lighting and, and other energy services, but it's looking at the, at the application of those energy services for agricultural use. So, for example, the use of solar-powered drip irrigation, which helps increase agricultural productivity and uses the water more uh, efficiently um, for agricultural purposes. It's using, using solar pumps for um, irrigation where possible. It's looking at, beyond that, though, um, at community uses, so for health uh, clinics, for schools, for uh, providing street lighting, um, now for helping to improve safety. There are parts of the world where children are going into the community where there are uh, street lights because that's the only way that they can actually see to do their homework in the evening. Mm. But it's a safety issue. It's particularly a women's issue as well. We saw after the earthquake in Haiti that there was a lot of sexual violence, partly because um, the women, as they were going to the bathrooms in the evening, were not safe. So we can provide these community services, and the question is, is how we do this in a way that really provides the, the end use for that family and community that can be sustainable, affordable, and better than the solutions that they're using right now, which are dirty and dangerous and expensive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We seem to have, I mean, there are two strands now. There, there, there's, the strand of, there's still the strand of really what energy access means, which, I mean, okay, everything you defined is within the context of energy access, but I guess one has to consider the eventual ambition I mean, are, is, it, is it possible to conceive of bringing the world up to an energy consumption level that is kind of equivalent to what is used in developed nations or not? And there's also the issue of this, of the very interesting issue you just raised of whether one's giving or whether it's being generated there. Is, is, is this in a way an aid project or is this not an aid project? I, I, I will let Fatty no speak uh, more to, to, the, to certain aspects of that, but I, I would just say that, um, first of all, um, there are areas where subsidy is still very helpful. It's very, very difficult to bring a solar home system to a family high up in the Andes using only a business approach. The profit margin is just too low. If you're putting the solar system and the battery is actually on either side of the donkey to balance the donkey so it doesn't fall off the mountain path, and you're taking it eight hours up a mountain path, it's very difficult with the best will in the world to do that from a purely unsubsidized profit margin. So smart subsidies can be helpful, they can be very useful, but at the same time they can also sometimes distort the market. So we have to be, on our policy side, we have to be very thoughtful and very mindful that what we're doing actually really helps serve um, the solutions and the benefit rather than, than distorting and actually undermining the benefit that we're trying to do. And just, just to say also very quickly that in fact um, we, we, are, we are seeing that, that there are definitions of, of, of energy access. Um, within the United Nations Sustainable Energy for All initiative, the World Bank and 11 partners around the world came up with what's called a global tracking framework where they're defining different levels of, of energy access. Not to say that it should be the end point, because I think on the other side of the equation, we can bring, we can bring our energy efficiency much more effectively so that it isn't this sort of um, us or them competing. In fact, we can, we can, it's a both and, we can really help to um, provide and, and, and support um, the, the solutions that, that low income communities have a right to, um, at the same time, uh, improving our own energy consumption. Okay. Fateh, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, of course, there are perhaps um, two, three very quick issues. <clears throat> First of all, when we say energy access, there are two hallmarks of energy access. Now, one is the access to electricity, especially for uh, uh, lighting and other electrical appliances. And second is uh, access to clean cooking services. So today we say 1.3 billion people have no access to electricity, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and 2.6 billion people use agricultural waste, animal waste, wood for cooking uh, uh, purposes. And it's mainly women and children who uh, adversely affected from that as a result of respiratory diseases, which lead to uh, premature deaths. And it's the second 
according to World Health Organization, second cause of uh, premature uh, diseases in the uh, developing uh, world. So they have these both aspects, this is one. Second, a, when we discuss about energy access, electricity access, we mainly look at renewable energies as a solution. I don't agree with that. Renewable energy is definitely, when it makes economic sense, Definitely, can, uh, the, uh, the countries, villages, and so on should go for that. But it is really, I find it a bit uh, obnoxious from the point of view of the developed world to ask the developing world to use renewable energies only in order to uh, clean up the mess that we have been causing years and years. So therefore, those countries should be choosing the, from their point of view, most economic option, and I hope in many cases, and it can be, especially off-grid sources and renewables, but they, they shouldn't be only allowed to use renewable energy, they should be allowed to use the most economic options. Let me give you one example. In the history of energy, one of the numbers which impressed me the most is the following. China, in 11 years of time, mid-80s and mid-90s, brought electricity to 500 million people, half a billion people, by mainly using coal. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So let, let, let's discuss on that. If you're a Chinese a village a, a, a peasant in China, this is a very good thing, and, and, and definitely. But it has implications for, for the climate. So therefore, it will be if we told China you can only use renewable energies, wind and solar, I am sure today many of those people wouldn't have access to, uh, to, uh, to, to energy, modern energy services. This is the second point. Third, finally, on the subsidies. Now, I mentioned in the morning, and uh, Madam Minister mentioned, today there are about half a billion US dollars of subsidies on fossil fuels. And we have calculated only 8% of the subsidies go to 20% uh, low, uh, low income groups, and more than 80% of the subsidies go to medium and high income groups. I completely agree with you that there should be some targeted subsidies for the kickoff subsidies for the uh, uh, poor of the poorest, but in general, across the board, giving subsidies may well be a good news for the medium and high income levels, and uh, it, is, it is the case uh, what we see uh, today. To sum up, I am really a, a very a, a eager, because we put this World Energy Outlook since 10 years on this issue, I am very eager not the Western countries to impose uh, the, the developing countries what kind of technologies, when and how much. So I think it is, we should give them the chances that we had in our past. Mm -hmm. Okay, Elaine, I know you wanted to pick up on that, on, on the points that Rishenda was saying beforehand. Um, kind of and and, and Fatih, yeah. yes, yeah. go. Because uh, I, I agree with what you say about the, the, maybe the danger of the subsidy discussion, and it reminds me of a parallel um, situation in the mobile industry, where you probably heard Hans Vestberg this morning talking about today we have more than six and a half billion mobile subscriptions around the world, and uh, by 2019 it'll be about 85% of the population having access to mobile communication. And that was not done on subsidies. That was done on economies of scale and global standards. And I think that um, the benefits that have been achieved, whether you look at healthcare, whether you look at education, whether you look at ability to just establish a livelihood when, when you have access to communications in Africa in so many parts of the world. We've been 100 years in Africa and looking at how to bring communications out to the rural areas. And I think. Um, that's where, so the first part was the parallel to also the discussion around the digital divide. That's what the energy access conversation reminds me about a little bit. But it's also a dependency uh, between the sectors because we're, you know, working with education, secondary education programs for girls in Africa, but we are so dependent in the most remote areas, in the poorest of the poor areas, we're dependent on the access to electricity, as is the whole community. So in order to, you know, bring the, there's still one in six people on the earth that don't have access to internet. And that is creating an inequality in and of itself. But in order to bring them online, we have to solve uh, the power challenge. And, and that's, you know, reducing the gap in, in two 
two parallel ways, but that are so interdependent. So, but I, again, I don't, I don't know if I, if I believe in just the subsidy idea, because I don't know that you're going to get scale. You can get a lot of small scale pilots that can contribute in any way, but how do you scale that? And then when you do scale it, how do you decouple um, the growth, there was a, a woman from London School of Economics, Carlotta Perez, that we had been working with for many years, who said, if the developing world comes up to the same standard of, of living as you know, Western Europe or, or North America or wherever, by 2050, we would need seven planets to sustain that. So at the same time, you, know, you, you have to reduce the gap in equity, whether it's energy, whether it's access to information, you have to decouple the, the economics from the negative impacts. So it's kind of enormous to be able challenge. To find the balance there. Yeah. Not only the developing countries use energy more efficiently, but the OECD countries, rich countries, should use less energy as yeah. well. So should, we should put it in the balance there. Yeah. And, and that is, that is the, 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 the benefit and the great um, hope, if you like, of, of technology and the science behind the development of some of these new technologies. You know, today, um, with some of the companies that I work with that are delivering these solutions, whether completely unsubsidized or some of them with some smart subsidy, you can do so much now with just even a, a one or two watt super bright LED that before we needed a 50 watt or 100 watt incandescent bulb. So, you know, with, with a lot of the, the ways that we are seeing now with tablets and smaller devices, we can stream television. You know, it used to be sort of, well, television required so many watts. Now, in fact, you have um, televisions that are color that are 12 watts. So even with a very, very small generation system, you can do an awful lot with it. So it's not just about how many kilowatt hours are we providing or consuming. It's about also how we can be using the best of innovation and technology to provide the solutions and provide the services that people want, but doing it in a way that's very efficient. So how do you get somebody on your energy escalator? Let's talk about financing a bit. How do you, how do you start somebody off? Either of you. Well, I would say that everybody's on the energy escalator. It's just that they, 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 they may be on the first step and it may not be moving up very fast. Um, as I mentioned uh, in, this morning, um, the current kerosene lighting market is something approaching 13, 37 billion dollars per year. And it's being increasingly recognized, in fact, that you can switch out the use of kerosene lighting for small, as a first step on the energy escalator, not to say it's the end rung or ladder, um, but as a first step, you can help to switch out from kerosene lighting to improve lighting solutions. In fact, Kenya, um, from a political standpoint, uh, declared itself a kerosene-free country from 2018. I hope they get there. Um, but there's a recognition increasingly, in fact, that there are solutions. And either through providing the savings from not spending every month on kerosene and candles, um, or as, as, as was mentioned, with some either prepaid solutions or what's called pay-as-you-go, small cash outlays, you can, you can basically pay using the same cash that we, you were using for kerosene lighting for these improved solutions. Now that sounds great, and the sector has been developing. I do want to provide a caveat, which is really for the companies, which is we are seeing there's, there's tremendous improvement in quality. One of the areas I still think that we need to get better is making sure that you have the appropriate after-sales service for those solutions once they're in the communities. So again, pretty much um, standard private sector, um, supply chains, developing the supply chains, making sure that if you have a warranty that you stand by it. Because I think when you can only afford to pay for that solution once, you want to make sure that you're really getting a quality solution. Yeah, so the business model of uh, Azuri, the company I mentioned uh, earlier, is definitely to, to try and offer a like-for-like -like replacement. So people are already spending on a weekly basis for kerosene, and the idea would be to charge them less, so they're actually saving money immediately, but they still just have to, to pay uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. Uh, but to be able to uh, make that uh, business model work, you need the uh, network there in the country of, of trusted people, people who trust each other to, to supply the equipment, to sell the scratch cards and, and so forth. And I, I think it, it takes time to build up those networks. Okay. Now, um, we would very much like to invite audience, audience questions. So please put up your hand if you have questions. Uh, there's one up here. Good. 
the microphone find that person? Hello. Uh, I have a question for uh, International Energy Agency and uh, also Sustainable Energy for All that uh, there are many business models that go on and on and it's not only technology that's important to reach uh, energy security for all. It's also innovation on the ground. So it's very important to document that what works and what does not work. Just to take an example of uh, cook stoves that uh, we know by last 50 years, the only improving the efficiency of cook stove does not mean that people are going to use. There is almost no focus on uh, renewable and reliable fuel supply along with the cook stove. Mm -hmm. so, so do you see or in your, uh, in your organization, do you emphasize on uh, documenting and spreading the news to the new startups for the uh, for the documenting of what works and what does not work. Not to go first. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, we as an organization, our main task uh, was, I should say, past tense, 10 years ago to bring this issue as a, in, a part of the international energy debate. And uh, we stayed there and we, we think we, are we have been successful uh, on that. But now, of course, we look at different cases. First of all, I should say that there are different success stories in different countries. It changed so much depending on the, the economic environment, cultural environment, and the political situation in the country. I gave you the issue of uh, uh, example of uh, uh, China. China is a different economic uh, model, and Chinese government took the decision and they went frontal. Without looking at the cost and benefit, they brought electricity to half a billion people. But now, in terms of uh, uh, cooking, uh, there are different models there. Shall we go for LPG? Shall we improve the efficiency? Shall we go to uh, improve biomass? There are different policies. What we do is we look at successful stories and say, these are the success stories, and other countries can only get the inspiration from them. But to, to take the exactly the same model in your country may not uh, be uh, working. So this is therefore it will be very difficult, unlike oil and gas uh, and uh, other energy sources, it will be very difficult to make a copy and paste in this uh, context. One of, the, one of the things to speak to the clean cooking side, you're absolutely right, not all, not all cooking solutions are equal. And there's an initiative called the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves that is working on exactly this issue, which is looking not only at more efficient cookstoves because they've been around for a long time, but those that truly deliver the health benefits in terms of reduction in um, smoke and bringing about the health improvements that we spoke about, reducing respiratory illnesses. And part of the challenge there is, is technology technological, which is bringing the, the best solutions to the market. Part of it is developing those market mechanisms so you can actually get them available to the households in those communities. And then part of it is also about consumer behavior, which is nobody, I mean, nobody wants to be told that they can't cook in a certain way. So it's also looking at the cultural adaptation. It's looking at, is this solution relevant in this particular context? Is it affordable? Is it something that people want to use? So you have to come at it from a, a variety of different perspectives. Um, it's not only, you know, have we got the actual solution, but it's then how it's utilized in, in that local context. Thank you. Another question. Uh, yep, there's one just here. About the last uh, issue, uh, you haven't mentioned solar cooking, which, which is also a possibility. And they, for example, in Ladakh in, in India, they are using it. But my real question is, if we get rid of all armies in the world, we can give people on the globe electricity, fresh water and uh, waste water treatment. We can follow Costa Rica's example. That's the only nation on the globe without an ar army. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very optimistic thought. Um, I, don't, I, guess, I guess that's a little bit beyond the scope of this panel, unless anybody wants to comment on the solar cooking right. aspect. Well, I have great sympathy with uh, the view that the military costs a lot of money. And when I was 
interviewed for the job of chief scientific advisor at the Department of Energy in, in London, and I was asked, why do you want this job? I said, it's because I'm a pacifist, and uh, I'm concerned that the future, as uh, we enter shortages of, of fuels, possibly of some types, and climate change conflict, it, it is a, a, a future that we really want to uh, avoid, so that's why I'm doing this job. Yeah. More questions? Over here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was just... Uh, okay, let me start over. Um, I, I often hear the word the words cost and uh, money being mentioned very often. And I was just curious if any one of you have ever heard of the resource-based economy model and what your thoughts about that are, uh, if you ever heard about it. And also, if money wasn't an obstacle, if money wasn't a part of the problem at all, how would you go about creating solutions to help people uh, just by realizing, uh, by measuring and realizing how much resources actually are available for everyone. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's uh, tough questions coming in, but uh, <laughs> I have a, a comment on that. I was thinking back what uh, you started with, David, about talking about the, um, you know, how do you set up I forget what you called your ladder, but how do you set up the whole value chain along the step of the way and try to get it profitable? And I think there, there are a lot of, um, and I know that's not exactly what was being asked, but I, I think there's a parallel there because um, in order to make things more cost efficient and take away the cost argument, if you will, at least to some extent, would be to look at how to leverage. I mean, when, when you started setting up this whole infrastructure and all these scratch tickets and all these different things along the way, that just reminds me again of the mobile industry, yeah. which I know so well, and thinking about, just use the cell phones. I mean, yeah. they have them anyway, right? Yeah. So, I mean, take away some of the cost burden there. Use your cell phone to charge for, and pay for small amounts of electricity. It's already happening in some markets. I mean, we have been looking for years at ways to even in the most remote village, if we, if we build a, a tower and, and power that on wind or solar, can we provide you know, access to electricity to the community by taking the excess power from the cell phone tower? And, and we did that in, in some cases in, in Kenya, where we were, I mean, someone earlier on one of the panels talked about the need you know, to get the vaccines and, and uh, refrigeration, and we did that. We just drew the cables down from the cell tower linked it to the vaccine and the health clinic. And so I think that rather than just looking at the energy sector, here's the energy sector, here's the telecom sector, here's transportation or whatever, and looking at them so inter independently, start looking you know, across the sector for gains on, on the economics and economies of scale. I think uh, the question, uh, just to add on that, it's a matter of uh, money. I think it's not a matter of money. It is, uh, according to our analysis, to bring uh, modern energy services to solving the, these two hallmarks, uh, which means electricity access and clean uh, cooking facilities. We spent each year, we need to spend about 50 billion, 49 exactly, billion dollar. This compares with the, uh, for example, each year we make about oil and gas upstream investments about 600 billion. US dollar. This is an issue of not the money, but the allocation of money, given the, whether or not this is a priority for the human beings uh, or not. Therefore, it is more than the cost, it is the allocation of the cost and where you take the priorities. I'd like to just, just speak to that particularly because um, I work with a network of about 1,500 energy entrepreneurs that are delivering energy solutions in a range of developing countries and a range of technologies and approaches, and, and it's exactly that. Um, I hear so many times that people say, well, it's not a question of the money. We have the money. The money's there. But in fact, it is a lot of these entrepreneurs speak about the challenges that they still have in getting the right access to the working capital. It is a question, um, you so rightly talked about the use of M-Pesa in Kenya for pay 
paying for some of these services, but that's not that mobile money service is not yet available widely in many other markets. In, in some it is, but the mechanism is also needed to be there for the consumers. If you're buying an energy asset, if you're buying a solar home system, um, how do you pay for it as a consumer? Are you able to get a loan from your local bank to actually pay for it? Are the terms right? Are they affordable for you as a household? So there's a huge financing issue. It's not so much about whether the dollars exist globally to do it, but how is that capital being utilized? Is it available for the companies, the entrepreneurs who are delivering these solutions? Let me just uh, slightly differ on that. I want to give one example. There is one uh, African country uh, whose name I will not give, about 60 million, about half of this country, has no access to energy services. And this is an oil and gas rich African country. And we have calculated, coming to the allocation of the resources, if this country would spend, it is oil and gas export revenues, not 6%, only 0.6% of this oil and gas export revenues to energy access, this problem would have been solved. 60 million people have access to uh, the uh, energy. Only 0.6, not even 1%. So this is therefore, it is important to look at the, in that context, the priorities, governance, and the government programs point of view as well. I wanted to respond to the second question. If money was not a problem, what would you do? Uh, we've been working on a project in the Department of Energy and Climate Change called the 2050 Calculator, which initially was a tool to help people answer that question uh, for the UK. So it was a, a physics and engineering-based tool that just said, what could you do? Uh, because if money weren't a problem, would that actually make it easy to power a country like the, the UK? Well, people, some people would still be anti-wind farm or anti-nuclear, or they'd say, you know, leave my lifestyle alone. And, uh, so we made a tool uh, to, to try and help people have constructive conversations based on the laws of physics and the realities of engineering. And we're now making uh, national calculators with other countries. Uh, we're helping uh, developing countries especially to make their own calculators that describe what is possible. And because some people do care about costs and because in fact money is an issue, we do include in these calculators estimates of the costs of different pathways as well. So then we use these uh, uh, tools as ways of uh, uh, helping people have constructive conversations and discuss the trade-offs between different options. For example, for a European country, how much lifestyle change are you willing to have in order to energy reduction, and how much do you want it to be done by technology change, and which technology changes, and which lifestyle changes, and okay, then your lifestyle needs this much energy. Where do you want it to come from? Bioenergy, nuclear, wind, and it, it visualizes those, those trade-offs. And uh, China has recently published its own calculator, as has Taiwan. And we're now working on a global calculator, which will be a tool in which you can uh, adjust the lifestyle and demands of the whole world and the supply choices, and then see what the climate change consequences are of that, that set of, of choices. So that will be coming out in the next 12 months. Thank you. We have a question from the online audience. Um, we have a question on Twitter from Cambridge UK asking what is the scope of energy access actually? Do we expect everyone to have ultimately to match the consumption seen in developed countries, also in the developing countries? So that, that was in a way where we started and it's, but it's still worth revisiting. I mean, wh what are we aiming for? What's our ambition? I would say one of, one of the areas that we're aiming for, we're looking at from a development standpoint, is we're looking beyond the Millennium Development Goals and towards what happens in 2015, and we're talking about sustainable development goals, and we're looking at whether or not we could have sustainable energy for all as one of the sustainable development goals, and looking within that at some of the indicators of, of what we would like to see, and certainly from the, the millions of deaths that we see per year now from the effects of um, the smoke and the emissions from kerosene-based lighting and from um, these rudimentary cooking solutions that in fact harm people's health, we would like to see um, ideally a, a complete elimination of any deaths 
as a result of those types of, of uh, cooking and, and lighting, or at least you know, getting down to, from where we are today to at least halving the number of deaths from that indoor air pollution. The, the World Health Organization is looking at this um, in great depth right now. And so you know, I think rather than defining it in a sort of esoteric term about kilowatt hours, we really need to be looking at it from, from the standpoint of benefits to people. I'd say the goal is clean energy cheaper than coal. And I think it is important to uh, bring in some, some numbers. Uh, earlier, we saw the picture of the solar panel uh, on the roof, and that's been, been put there without subsidy. And people might come away with the impression, oh, there's no need for any subsidy then. Solar, solar power is already cheap enough. But actually, that little panel delivering a very valuable service is delivering it at quite a high cost yeah. per, per kilowatt hour. And I'd, I'd like to give you an example to think about this. Have you ever bought a double-A battery? And did you pay about a dollar for it? And did you think about the cost per kilowatt hour you were paying there? Because inside that battery, there's one watt hour of energy. It gives you one volt, uh, one amp of current for about one hour, which is one watt hour. That means you were paying $1,000 per kilowatt hour for that battery. And that's, you, you bought it rationally because it's a valuable service that you get. It, it makes you able to go off-grid with your little double-A battery. But, uh, so when they pay for that, that little panel on their roof through the weekly uh, scratch, card, scratch card payments or whatever it is, they're, they're not paying a price that is cheap compared to the price of coal or European electricity. Here, electricity costs 15 cents a kilowatt hour or something like that. And in the UK, we've recently had a big political rumpus because the price was uh, driven up by an extra 8% by some e eco uh, obligations and, and uh, tariffs and, and so forth. And some of those tariffs have been removed to bring that back the cost from 16 cents per kilowatt hour back to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. What they were probably paying in India and Africa for that little solar panel, if you were work to work it out and say, what are they paying per kilowatt hour? I expect it's it going to be something like 100 or 200 cents per kilowatt hour is what they're actually paying. If we want them to really start living like Europeans uh, and to, to have that quality of life that, that we enjoy, the goal has to be clean energy cheaper than coal, and that will also solve climate change at the same time. Yeah, I don't think it's about living like Europeans, actually. I think for me, the whole issue of energy access is more just about inclusion. You know, it's, it's financial inclusion, it's social inclusion, it's digital inclusion. It's about, you know, having the fundamental rights to so many things like access and education and um, the right to earn a living. And, you know, so for me, this whole energy access discussion is, is really about equity and inclusion and, and, and maybe not saying, I don't know, um, there is a gap, of course, we talked about that earlier between the developed and the developing world, but it's about closing the gap, but bringing people into you know, the society in, in the right way. So just let me uh, uh, link this discussion with the uh, climate change. <clears throat> and also choice of fuel, choice of technology. <clears throat> now, when we have pushed this agenda, the, the, uh, the agenda of the uh, energy access, many of our uh, governments, many people told us, you are saying energy access to 1.3 billion people or under 2.6 billion people, but we have already a big problem of climate change. If they have access to, uh, to, uh, to energy, and it is already a very difficult uh, solution, climate change problem will be even much worse to, to be solved. So this was an argument uh, that uh, some people uh, uh, put forward, and we analyzed the situation. And I can tell you uh, what the result is. Even if all these people would have access to energy in the context what we just mentioned, in terms of lighting and some productive means and the others, Global CO2 emissions in 2035, in 20 years of time, will increase only about 0.8%, almost nothing, peanuts. Even if they follow the energy demand patterns that the OECD countries follow up to now. A bit of fossil fuels, then renewables uh, here, uh, uh, the uh, coal here, gas there only 0.9%. Why? 
the, here the important number is not 1.3 billion, but how much energy they use, the amount of energy they use. Therefore, the argument of energy excess would aggravate the problem of climate change is completely wrong. Therefore, it is of course very good if those people in the Africa and elsewhere would choose to go for renewable energies, but we shouldn't patronize them to tell them, do you do this, this or that in order to, uh, to clean up our cumulative emissions there, or what China is doing, what others are doing today. So this is, uh, I think, something that we need to uh, keep in mind, that the cause of climate change is and never will be the energy excess efforts of the uh, developing nations. And just to follow up on that, I mean, that's to 2035, when yeah. 1.3 billion people are using energy, but perhaps not that much energy. And then as you project out from that, and energy usage presumably increases greatly, is the argument that even if they're using coal substantially up till 2035, renewables will be also coming along at the same time. And so as, in as that level increases, mm. you're going to be able to get rid of the fossil fuels. Is that the of idea? Of course, if, if they all go for coal, this is not a... a uh, good news, and I don't think that they will go off for coal. For many uh, off-grid solutions in the rural area, uh, the renewable energies make economic sense. Mm. But for the urban, for uh, I mentioned China and today India, about more than 300 million people have uh, no access to electricity in India. How can we say Indians don't use coal, only go for solar and wind? I, it will be. I believe personally, and I, I represent the rich countries, OECD countries, see, I would feel uncomfortable to tell them don't use uh, coal when 300 million people have no access to electricity. So therefore, uh, they should choose what they want, but we should, globally, we should find the mechanisms to make them go for more sustainable choices, not to, uh, to put, put the stick on the Indians to go for the fuel choice that we wanted to see. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay, we are pretty much out of time, so I just wonder whether anybody had any points they wanted to pick up on that they felt were left hanging. No need to if you don't want to, but last chance. Um, I just wanted to answer the question on, on solar cooking because uh, we, didn't, we didn't get to that. And just to say, certainly, um, it's a part of the mix for certain, certain contexts, but there's no silver bullet solution. Um, in my own kitchen at home, I use multiple different solutions. I've been into many households in, in India and across different countries where, in fact, they use multiple solutions. Part of it is affordability. Part of it is um, uh, using LPG when the family is coming to impress the family. There's a range of different solutions, and you really have to look at giving choices to families, giving choices to consumers. And I think it's, it's not imposing an A or B or C. It's really about providing that customer choice. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Well, okay, thank you to all of you and to the audience. Uh, it's been a fascinating panel. Thank you very much indeed. There is now a uh, coffee break for around about 20 minutes.